Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we are going to start a series for this module, the next five videos, that will talk about pandas. Now, neural networks can accept tabular data, which is data like you might view in Microsoft Excel. Many traditional data science problems are set up this way. Many competitions on Kaggle are set up this way. We will get into image and audio processing and textual natural language processing later in this course where we won't use pandas. But for the beginning, when we deal with some of the traditional data sets, pandas is very useful for dealing with data sets that can be divided into columns. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Neural networks, you receive a variety of data to predict on. One type of data that you will read is CSV files, and this deals with tabular data. We'll spend a few class sessions on tabular data, a few modules, but we'll also get very much into images and other more advanced inputs that neural networks can deal with that neural networks are particularly good at. But for now, we're going to look at pandas and see how to deal with tabular data. Here we do the pandas read CSV. You'll see this a lot as we read different data sets. I'm reading this from the web, so this should work in Colab as well as if you're running this locally. And it prints out just a dump of the, of the data frame, the first five rows of it anyway. We can also use the display function that prints it a little nicer. So this shows you the miles per gallon data set. This is a classic data set that you see in a lot of machine learning literature. We'll use it some, but not a great deal. It shows the miles per gallon for each of these various cars, particularly cars made in the 1970s. These values of miles per gallon, you try to predict using these other values that you see here. This shows a way that we can print some basic statistics on this value, and it shows kind of how you work with some of of pandas. If you run this, it basically gives you each of the fields. So the field is named miles per gallon, the next field is named cylinders, and so on and so forth. And this gives you some of the statistics, the mean, the variance, the standard deviation, and so on. Kind of hard to read, but we'll make it easy to read in a moment. Let's see how we're actually doing this though. We are taking the data frame and we're only using the data types that are integer and float. That's effectively dropping the name. Then we get the headers of these values and we create an empty list called fields. And we're going to loop over each of the field in the, in the columns. So each column we're going to loop over and we're going to append to fields a dictionary that we're just building on the fly. And this dictionary has four elements in it, four entries, name, which is just the field that we're on, mean, which is the data frame. This is how you take the mean of a column in a data frame, dot mean, dot variance, and dot standard deviation. You can do median, a whole, whole bunch of statistical values are available to you. And then we print them out. So this is a good example of how you build up a list of dictionaries, which is a very common structure to use. This is, this is kind of like a database table. And this is also exactly the format that you can put data in to load it directly into a data frame. So here we'll see that we can take this data that we created here and turn it into a pandas data frame. Very handy because now we can display it nicely. So we've basically created a data frame from scratch. All these mean values we put in, names, standard deviations, and variances. So this dictionary that we were adding one by one, those are like the rows in this particular table that we're creating. Now, missing values. The reality is the data that you deal with as a data scientist always has, has problems. In fact, if the data is perfect, I would almost be afraid that there's a problem that I haven't seen. Here, we're going to load in auto miles per gallon again. That's that same data set. But we're saying here that the NA values are NA and question mark because there's a few question marks in this particular data set. There's a horsepower value that's missing. So if you run this, it will show you that yes, horsepower does have an NA value. Then we fill the missing values. We take the median. Now median is usually a better value to put in for missing values than mean because median is not that sensitive to outliers, whereas mean is. If you have a huge outlier 
value, that's going to affect your mean, but it's not really going to affect your median. So we take the horsepower and we fill in the missing, the NA values, the missing values with that median. You could also just drop the NA values too if you if you want to do that. That drops the entire row that has a NA value. And now we print out that horsepower does indeed not have a an NA because we've we've filled it in. Outliers are another thing that you potentially have to deal with. You can remove them or deal with them in other ways. i show you how to remove them here. We are defining an outlier as something that is a higher number, maybe two or more standard deviations away. Two might be a bit close, but maybe three or higher. But this shows you how to remove. We want to remove a fair amount, so we'll remove anything that is more than two standard deviations above or below the mean. The first thing we do is we calculate what our drop rows are. So we are essentially asking for a list of the values where the absolute value of each of these individual values, and name is the column that we're calculating the outliers of, we subtract it from the mean and we make sure that it is not that amount of standard deviations above. And then we drop these rows that we've gotten all of the indexes to and we use axis equals zero because we're dealing with rows, not columns. We're not deleting columns. In place means that it modifies the actual data frame and does not return a second data frame. We run the function so it's in memory. This then loads that same data set and creates the feature vector. It does that by replacing the, the horsepower with the median. We're going to drop name because we, we don't need it. It doesn't really matter so much for this example. but uh, And then we look at the length of the miles per gallon before we drop those values and after. And we see that we went from 398 to 388. And I show some of the, some of the data here. You probably really can't see a difference. Dropping fields. It's pretty easy to drop fields in pandas. If we wanted to drop the name field, we simply do this, and it tells you the number of columns before and after, or the, the actual columns. You can see name was there, and now it's very handy to be able to delete entire columns from the data frame. We can also concatenate things together. This becomes very useful when we start to generate dummy variables and other variables, and we need to add them into our data frame. What this is going to do is we're going to create basically a new data frame that is just two of the values together. So this is creating just name and horsepower. So what we're doing is we're extracting horsepower, we're extracting name, and then we're concatenating those two together as columns. Col axis one always means columns. And you get this nice resulting. We're just displaying the first five rows, but this is how you can subselect one of the many ways you can subselect and build up data frames from scratch. Some of the assignments will want you to do something very much like this. So this is this is useful to be able to take these columns or series and put them together to build entirely new data frames. You can also concatenate rows together. What this is doing is taking the first two and the last two rows. So we're taking data frame from 0 to 2, and then from minus 2, which means 2 back from the end to the end, and we're concatenating them together. Now this is axis 0 because we're dealing with rows. Another thing that you will often use Pandas for is training, breaking your training data into training and validation sets, and even k-folding. We'll get into k-folding more in um, a later module. But you can basically take your data and break it into a training and validation split so that you have your entire data set here, but you're taking 80% for training, 20% for validation. You'll usually train and fit your model on the training set, and you'll evaluate that model created from the training set on your validation set. This is some simple code that shows how to do this. We're basically using the mask here to create a, a mask of values. So this is just a list of trues and falses. The trues are the ones that will be included, and the falses are the ones that are not. So since we're taking 80%, the training data frame basically gets the data frame with the mask applied opposite mask. And we're able to print out that we have our training set of 312 and our validation set of 86. This is very important. You don't send data frames directly on to Keras. You need to be able to use NumPy for that. NumPy.values is what does this. So 
here you can see it's basically taken the values and created a matrix. Now you may not want all of these values, like that name here is not numeric, so that could cause problems. You can pass in a list. Now you often see this in Python as a source of some confusion when you have the double brace for a array. It's not a double brace. It just means that the index that you're passing in is a list. So you're saying that I want all the rows from the data frame, but I want just these columns. And if you run that one now without the name there, now you don't have that ugly character string in there. It's pure numeric, which is what you want to have. We'll see more about this when we learn how to prepare feature vectors for neural networks. You can save a data frame that you've created or modified to a CSV file. This allows you to view it outside of Jupyter Notebook using Excel or preferably something more advanced for CSV file viewing. You have to be careful with Excel. It tends to modify CSV files and will even corrupt them by removing leading zeros and other things. And it also has kind of limited support of text encodings like UTF-8. Just using Excel to view things can be okay, but just be aware it may reformat some of the data and corrupt it. Now, when you save it as a CSV file, that can be useful because that's what I often have you submit those, those files to me in that form for some of the assignments. When you compete in the Kaggle competition, you'll often submit a CSV file for that. So I'll post exact requirements for the Kaggle competition for for this semester when we reach that point. The command to save a CSV file is simply this, to CSV, and we are essentially just shuffling this data frame and then writing it back. Index equals false, usually you want index equals false because that is going to tell it not to put a row number on each, on each row. Now when you run this, it just says done and it generates the CSV in the path that we said Dot means the current directory. If you're using Google Colab, which you probably are, you should put, put the path to your mapped G drive up there and then it will output it to a place that you can get a hold of that file. And you can take a look at that in Google Docs or something else. Google Docs is a very good program for viewing, for viewing CSVs. Now saving a data frame to Pickle. Pickle is a binary file format. So when you save it as CSV, you're basically writing it out to a text file, which you often read it from, but you can run into very, very small precision problems when you bring things back and forth between CSV files. Usually this is not a problem. It's only a problem if you're trying to diff two files. So Pickle will ensure that you get an exact rendering of the of the file. And it also stores other metadata that is stored in the data frame that simply doesn't fit into a CSV, like row numbers. If I run this, it simply tells me that, that I'm done. Again, it did this, it did this re-index scene again. We will load the pickle file back. It's done with this, pickle load. Pickle dump is how you save it. And this loads it back in. Now here's something important to note. This is the file, these are all the columns and everything, but here's how you can tell the difference between loading a pickle file and loading a CSV file. Notice the row numbers don't line up because we, we re-indexed it and we didn't rebuild that index. So that, that was stored in the pickle file. That would have been lost in the CSV file. Now, typically you wouldn't mind necessarily losing, losing those, but your actual row numbers from when it was first loaded, these are only out of order because we shuffled it, but that, that is not something that would be stored into a CSV file. Thank you for watching this video on the introduction to pandas. We will see how to do more advanced processing with pandas in the other parts of this module. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.